So I'm glad to be here today to do the second part of this sermon. Um, in the last sermon, we did um, the history of pandemics. And so <clears throat> in this sermon, I want to go back into Matthew 24 and to um, look at some more of what he was talking about. Um, the sermons for the signs of the times in this sermon is about worldwide events as they pertain to the end times. <clears throat> And um, excuse me, if my voice is, comes and goes because I'm, I'm dealing with allergies and sinuses, this is a bad time of year for that. Um, but uh, basically, I, what I what I like to do when I do sermons is when there's something that I don't understand or if there's something I want, I really want to go into, I'll do research over that topic and then I'll share it with the church. And uh, basically, when we were looking, I've been looking at the signs of the times. Obviously, we're going through. Um, this pandemic that should that should be over here pretty soon. <clears throat> so I want to go ahead and do um, the last sermon over pandemics. And so what we did was we went from before the time of Christ, we went through every known world pandemic from that time until this one and the information that was relevant to those each one of those pandemics. And if you're interested in, in um, watching that sermon, if you haven't seen it, you can you can get on our YouTube channel and watch that sermon. But basically, this sermon I want to go over was, <clears throat> in general, <clears throat> worldwide natural disasters as far as it um, pertains to, like, weather um, and, um, and um, things like the wildfires in California, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, flooding, those type of things. I'm going to leave famines and earthquakes false prophets and the wars and rumors of wars for future sermons, because I don't want these sermons to get too long. But basically the one thing that I felt like some of all this stuff had in common was climate change, which I knew nothing about. Um, so that was what I really went into researching the sermon about was climate change and what connection it probably has to, um, to this, to the scripture that we're reading here. Um, just like, um, um, we were saying that the, the, you can find these signs of the times in Matthew 24. Um, but there's also a verse in Daniel um, that's related to this. And that's found in Daniel 12, verse 4. And we're going to read that here in just a second. But it's, it's in Daniel 12, verse 4, he talks about the increase of knowledge in the, in, in, the, in the end times. And so I wanted to show you how that and this verse are connected <clears throat> and the role that climate change has to do with that. So I'm not knowing much about climate change. What I did is I tried to find the most apolitical sources for information like NASA, things like that, where it's just science, um, scientists talking about the topic because I don't want to get into politics or whatever. But I don't know because I don't even know anything about that for its politics, but I just didn't want to get into that. So I tried to find stuff like NASA, things like that to talk about and what the scientists are saying. Um. So let's go ahead and get started in Matthew 24. I'm going to go ahead and read it from verse 1 to uh, verse 8 so we can get a context for those who are, are didn't le listen to the last sermon um, for what the Bible is, is talking about here. So this is Jesus um, as he was talking about the, uh, the last days. And then let me go ahead and start. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of an age? <clears throat> And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear wars of and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginnings of sorrows. And so what I also want to do is go ahead and read Daniel 12, verse 4. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read that one verse. Um, and this is what it says. 
But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the end, to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. All right. So what I wanted to do was kind of show you the path from what was happening in Daniel 12, 4 until what we're talking about here in Matthew 24. Um, Basically, what the, the spiritual context of that verse is in the in the end times, the knowledge of the spiritual understandings of <clears throat> the writings of Daniel and also Revelation, we would learn and learn um, more about what all that meant um, in the in the end times because we would have more <clears throat> events that have come to pass so that we could line up things and, and we would know what those prophecies meant. But as with many prophecies in the Bible, there's usually a spiritual and a literal um, interpretation of those prophecies because usually what he, he, he the, the prophecy will tell you a literal event and then there will be a spiritual context that went along with that. And so what we're, I'm going to show you is that um, in Daniel 12, 4, when he's talking about the, the increase of knowledge, he's, he's not just talking about the spiritual increase of knowledge, but also the literal increase of knowledge that happened from about the Middle Ages until our time today. <clears throat> and so, as you know, during the Middle Ages, or the Dark Ages, as we commonly know, the the, the work of the enemy, the, what they what the, uh, Satan was trying to do was to eradicate God's people through ignorance. So all Bibles, it was illegal to have a Bible. It was illegal to worship together. Um, you had to go to a priest to um, to get to uh, to get any knowledge of the Bible. And basically, be- through many centuries of uh, like the the Bible being um, made illegal to have or copies of or all that. Basically, people's ignorance of the scriptures increased. And as you saw, if, if you ever studied the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages, that created a lot of hardship on the people. But as God always does, he provided a way for his word, and for his people to continue through the, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, like people like the Waldens, this and, and people like that, where the knowledge of God's, um, of God's word continued through the Dark Ages. But as time went on, um, things such as the printing press um, came were invented, and what the this general increase of knowledge did was the world started to change upon the increase of knowledge, and <clears throat> Bibles were begin to be began, began to be printed and, and spread and shared throughout the world, and as people studied the God scriptures the light of the world came back into the world, right? So that is a, a direct um, correlation between an increase of knowledge and the spiritual increase of knowledge that happened. So in the Middle Ages, which was from a period of from 476 to about 1450, the Middle Ages, also known as the medieval or post-classical era, historians refer to the early part of this period as Dark Ages due to the loss of recorded history after the fall of the Roman Empire in AD, um, 476 AD. The Middle Ages was an unstable period that lasted for nearly a millennium. Historians often group the era into three distinct periods, the early Middle Ages, the high Middle Ages, and the late Middle Ages. The early Middle Ages lasted from about 476 AD to about 1000 AD. Um, It's also known as late antiquity. This period shows most powers were building after the collapse of the Roman Empire and the beginning of Islam in the Middle East. Then you have the Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages, which was about 1000 AD to 1250 AD. Um, it was 250. It was a 250 year period, year period that saw the height of the Catholic Church power in the Crusades. And then you have the Late Middle Ages, which was 1250 AD to about 1450 AD. Um, a period that saw the Black Plague, the beginnings of the European exploration, and the invention of the printing press. So. In the early modern era, which was a period from about 1450 AD to 1750 AD, um, was uh, immediately followed by the middle, uh, fall of the Middle Ages, saw a resurgence of the values of and philosophies from the classical era. When you think of Leonardo da Vinci, William Shakespeare, Johann Sebastian Bach, and Christian Columbus, you're thinking of the early modern era. 
The major movements in, po in politics, religion, and ge um, ge geography helped to guide human civilization into the modern era. These movements include the Renaissance um, hum humanism, which was from 1480 to about 1580, um, the Protestant Reformation, which was about 1517 AD to 1648 AD, the European Renaissance, which was 1450 AD to 1600 AD, and the Enlightenment, which was 1650 AD to 1880, which was an intellectual movement that is also called the Age of Reason, saw the re-examination of politics, economics, and science giving way to Romanticism in the 19th century. The European Renaissance or rebirth occurred during this period, as well as the discovery of col and colonizations of the Americas and the Age of Enlightenment. And then you have the modern era, which is from 1750, 1750 AD to, to, the, to today, um, in 2021. The influences of both the Renaissance and the Enlightenment led to a technological boom in the modern era, also known as the late modern era. The world of politics was rocked by wars, revolution, and the end of the monarchy in many countries. Because of our history, of the last three centuries is so well documented, it's possible to examine each period of the modern era on its own. And I'm not, I'm not going to read all that, but you have the first industrial revolution, which was 1760 AD to about 1840 AD, which was the beginning of the modern era that saw several technological innovations, including the invention of the cotton gin, the increase of the city factories and mills, and the completion of the Erie Canal, which I'm reading that because that's important. You had the Revolutionary Period, the Age of Imperialism, Victorian, um, the Victorian era. You had the Second Industrial Revolution, which was 1869 AD to 1914 AD, often referred to as the Technological um, Revolution, period in which the light bulb, the telephone, the airplane, and the Model T automobile were invented. Then you had World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and then you have the con uh, contemporary period, which is 1945 to today, also known as the information age, the period in which technological advances define social, economic, and political life. So that that is going to be important, especially as we go back in the next couple of sermons when we're talking about wars and rumors of wars um, and things like that, because all this stuff is, is connected together. And so one of the, the side effects and I'm, I want to share this information as well, is the, the world population. Because most of our lives, we're, we have all kind of come come to be, uh, to know the world to be around 7.8 billion people in the world, right? But most people don't really realize that that's an abnormal, uh, that's abnormal for the world. Most of the time, the world was never more than a couple hundred million people in the whole entire world. Right now in the United States, we have around 365 million people just in the United States alone, which was the world population for most of the time before um, these late periods. So <clears throat> here's some facts I got from Wikipedia. In demographics, the world population is the total number of humans currently living and was estimated to have reached uh, 7.8 billion people as of March 2020. The world population has experienced continuous growth following the fam Great Famine of 1315 through 1317 and the end of the Black Death in 1350. When it was near 307, 370 million, the highest global population growth rates with um, increases of over 1.8% per year occurred between 1955 and 1975, peaking at 2.1% between 1965 and 1970. The global population is still increasing, but there is a significant uncertainty about its long, um, long-term long trajectory due to changing rates of fertility and, morale, and mortality. The, the, the UN Department of Economics and Social Affairs projects between 9 to 10 billion people by 2050 and gives an 80% confidence interval of 10 to 12 billion by the end of the 21st century. That is not normal, like I was saying, because most of the world population has always been a couple of hundred million people or less. So with the rise of technology and the efficiency of which we can produce food, clothing, shelter, etc., um, what has you know factories and mills and then we have to power those factory mills with uh with uh energy coal whatever gas whatever um that has allowed the population to boom in just a short period of time from 
a couple million to, to around 7.8 billion people around the world. But with that comes the constant need to feed, house, clothes, et cetera, all of those people, which is why um, the, the technological revolution, the factories, these things became very important and prevalent as the years have gone on. But with that has come a, a, um, a side effect that scientists are saying is prevalent today, which is what they call climate change. And so this is where... Um, I wanted to um, kind of go into that research that I went into. What exactly is climate change? Because you hear a lot of people talking about it, but you, I really have never been um, so interested that I, I really dug deep into it. So that's what I did for this. So this is from NASA. What is climate change? And so the short answer is climate change describes a change in the average conditions such as temperature and rainfall in a region over a long period of time. NASA scientists have observed Earth's surface, um, have observed that Earth's surface is warming, and many of the warmest years on record have happened in the last 20 years. So, um, they say there's a difference between weather and climate. Weather describes the conditions outside right now in a specific place. For example, if you see that it's raining outside right now, that is a way to describe today's weather. Rain, snow, wind, hurricanes, tornadoes, these are all weather events. Climate, on the other hand, is more than just one or two rainy days. Climate describes the weather conditions that are expected in a region at a particular time of year. It is usually rainy or usually dry. It is typically hot or typically cold. A region's climate is determined by observing its weather over a period of many years, generally 30 years or more. So, for example, one or two weeks of rainy weather wouldn't change the fact that Phoenix typically has a dry desert climate. Even though it's rainy right now, we still expect Phoenix to be dry because that is usually the case. So what is climate change? Climate change describes a change in the average conditions, such as temperature and rainfall, in a region over a long period of time. For example, um, much of the United States has been covered. Uh, well, this remember, this is NASA, so this is not literal. But they say, for example, 20,000 years ago, man, much of the United States was covered in glaciers, which we know that's not true. Um is the earth is 6,000 years old. In the United States today, we have a warmer climate and fewer glaciers. Global climate change refers to the average long-term changes over the entire earth. These include warming temperatures and changes in precipitation, as well as the effects of earth's warming, such as rising sea levels, shrinking mountain glaciers, ice melting at a faster rate than usual in Greenland, Antarctica, and the Arctic, and changes in flower and plant um, blooming times. Earth's climate has constantly been changing, even long before humans came into the picture. However, the scientists uh, have observed a u- unusual changes recently. For example, Earth's average temperature has been increasing much more quickly than they would expect over the past 150 years. So how much is Earth's climate changing right now? Some parts of Earth are, are warming faster than others, but on average, global Air temperatures near Earth's surface have gone up about two degrees Fahrenheit in the past 100 years. In fact, the past five years have been the warmest five years in centuries. Many people, including scientists, are concerned with this about this warming. As Earth's climate continues to warm, the intensity and amount of rainfall during storms, such as hurricanes, is expected to increase. Droughts and heat waves are also expected to become more intense as the climate warms. When the whole Earth's temperature changes by one or two degrees, that change can have big impacts on the health of Earth's plants and animals, too. And for all of us here in Texas, like, you know, we've had a few hurricanes to hit us. And the the amount of rainfall has been amazing. Like the flooding in Houston and South Texas was just a year or two ago, I believe, was um, it was it was pretty incredible. Um, how much rainfall has fallen. But um, let's go ahead. Let's keep going. What causes climate change? There are a lot of factors that contribute to Earth's climate. 
However, scientists agree that Earth has been getting warmer in the past 50 to 100 years due to human activities. Certain gases in Earth's atmosphere block heat from escaping. This is called the greenhouse effect. These gases keep Earth warm like the glass in a greenhouse, uh, like a, the glass in a greenhouse keeps plants warm. Human activities such as burning fuel um, to power factories, cars, and buses are changing the natural greenhouse. Um, um, these changes cause the atmosphere to trap more heat than it's used to, leading to a warmer Earth. So does what we do matter? Yes. When human activities create greenhouse gases, Earth warms. This matters because oceans, land, air, plants, animals, and energy from the sun all have an effect on one another. The combined effects of all these things give us um, our global climate. In other words, Earth's climate functions like one big connected system. Thinking about things as a system means looking for how every part relates to others. NASA's Earth observing satellite collect information about how our planet's uh, atmosphere, water, and land are changing. By looking at this information, scientists can observe how Earth's systems work together. This will help us understand how small changes in one place can contribute to bigger changes in Earth's global climate. So, uh, what I decided to do, there's a lot of different areas that we could go in, but I decided to look at the, the, the natural disasters that we have that affect North America. Because typically volcanoes, tsunamis, those things are, are related to earthquakes. And I'm going to leave that for another sermon. But what some of the major things that happen over here in North America are the fires, the flooding, the, uh, the hurricanes and tornadoes. And what I wanted to know was how, how closely connected is global um, climate change to those things directly or indirectly. And uh, somehow more uh, uh, higher degrees of correlation than others. So with the fires, like say in California and the West Coast that we have in America, um, what is the science connecting wildfires to climate change? And here's, here's what they had to say. Climate change has inexorably stacked this deck in favor of bigger and more intense fires across the American West over the past two decades. Scientists have shown Increasing heat, changing rain and snow patterns, shifts in plant communities, and other climate-related changes have vastly increased the likelihood that fires will start more often and burn more intensely and wildly than they have in the past. The scale and intensity of the wildfires burning across the western U.S. right now is staggering, says Philip uh, Higuerera, a wildfire scientist and paleontologist at the University of Montana. More than 5 million acres have burned um, this year already, and much more have yet to come. Let's see here. All right. Um, climate change exacerbates the factors that create perfect fire conditions. Lower precipitation and warmer air temperatures drive the forest and other vegetation. Add strong winds and decades of fire suppression into the mix, and you have a dangerous recipe for wildfire. Um, Noah Diffenbaugh, a climate scientist at Stanford University, makes a baseball analogy to de describe increase in risk. If there's a three-run home run, a three-run home run in baseball, it's the home run that definitely caused the runners to round the bases and score. The home run is the prox uh, proximal cause of the event, but because but people being on base, he says, and global warming um, is putting people on base, is the reason why like the impact was bigger than that. Other factors also hike fire risks, like forest management decisions that have allowed for the buildup of vast amounts of vegetation that can quickly turn into fuel, as well as more problematic issues like the slow creep of houses and other infrastructure into risky areas. But for fires near that so-called wildland urban interface, as well as more remote forest centered burns, climate change has definitely heightened the baseline risk um, involved. And to be honest about it, guys, like... Last, I think it was last year. Like I was on Facebook, and I had like there were friends of mine that had, or that had posted pictures of the wildfires in California, and it was insane how that it looked like a movie. It didn't even look real, um, but it was real because they were. I mean, it's videotape of people going down the road, and like you can see the whole backdrop just is on fire. Um, so with the, with the wildfires. Um, on the West Coast, that is directly connected to climate change, 
says the scientists. Now, the next one I wanted to go over was tornadoes, because especially here in Texas, we experience a lot of tornadoes. Um, and this is something that's very common to our area. And with this one, um, it has the, is there a connection between tornadoes and climate change? It is, but it's more of an indirect connection, and I'll explain how, I'll explain that too. Tornadoes have been recorded all over the world, but the United States experiences around a thousand of them each year, which is far more than anywhere else on the planet. Most of these occur in Tornado Alley, an area of the Great Plains region where the atmospheric conditions are just right for massive tornado spawning thunderstorms. The resulting um, tornadoes leave a trail of destruction in their wake, often wildly with often with deadly consequences. Scientists agree that climate change is, is changing and humans are responsible. The burning of fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and gas release huge amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year, which is leading to a rise in global temperatures known as global warming. Global warming is just one symptom of the larger problem of climate change. Climate change has also caused an increase in extreme weather condition, uh, events all over the world. Extreme weather events is a catch-all term for a variety of very different weather phenomena, such as some of which are easier to contribute to climate change than others. For example, scientists can say with a high degree of certainty that a warming planet will lead to more severe droughts in some areas and heavier rainfall in others. Unfortunately, other weather events such as tornadoes are much harder for climatologists to predict. Uh, but they do say tornadoes are changing. I guess that's uh, a direct one. Predicting whether climate change will have an effect on the frequency and power of tornadoes is a challenge. For all their destructive fury, tornadoes are relatively small when compared to some other extreme weather events. Hurricanes, for example, can span hundreds of miles, whereas the biggest tornado ever recorded measured 4.2 kilometers or 2.6 miles wide. There are also very short-lived, lasting for a few seconds to a few hours as opposed to days or weeks at a time. This makes them very difficult to model in the climate uh, simulations that scientists use to project the effects of climate change. Instead, scientists must attempt to predict how climate change might affect the individual weather ingredients that support the development of supercell thunderstorms, the type that produce tornadoes. These weather ingredients are warm or moist air, an unstable atmosphere, and and wind at different levels moving in different directions at different speeds, a phenomenon known as wind shear. As global temperature rise, the hotter the atmosphere is able to hold more moisture, the, the hotter atmosphere is able to hold more moisture. This increased atmospheric instability, a vital supercell ingredient. On the other hand, as the planet warms and wind shear, Another vital ingredient is likely to decrease. These two forces work against each other, and it is in difficult to anticipate which might have a greater impact on tornado formation. So the question is, is climate change to blame? The fourth national climate assessment summarizes the complicated relationship between tornadoes and climate change. Some types of extreme weather, e.g. rainfall and extreme heat, can directly attribute to global warming. Other types of of extreme weather such as tornadoes are also exhibiting changes which may be linked to climate change, but scientific uh, understanding isn't detailed enough to project direction and magnitude of future change. In other words, we still have a lot to learn about how climate change might affect tornadoes. One thing we know for certain is that we live in a warmer, wetter world thanks to climate change, and this is likely to have an effect on extreme weather events, including tornadoes. Unfortunately, in the case of one of nature's most violent storms, we cannot yet predict what that effect might be. So with the fires, it's directly um, contributed to a, a warm, dry climate in the west part of, of the United States. Um, with tornadoes, it's more of the atmosphere with uh, the warmer weather, the instability of the uh, conditions of the, of the, of the, of the you know, our, our Basically, the atmospheric conditions are inst unstable. So I would say that the tornadoes are indirectly related if they're related at all. So that was one of the things I wanted to know was tornadoes. But one of the, the, the third thing here that I want to go over was hurricanes, because hurricanes um, seem to be one of the things that could be directly contribute to um, climate change. So let's go ahead. There's a study 
um, that climate change has been influencing, influencing where topi- tropical cyclones rage, which is hurricanes. Uh, hurricanes come out of tropical storms, basically. While the global average number of tropical cl- uh, cyclones each year has not budged from 86 over the last four decades, climate change has been influencing the locations where these deadly storms occur. According to new NOAA-led research, okay, new research indicates that the number of tropical cyclones has been rising since 1980 in the North Atlantic and Central Pacific, while storms have been declining in the Western Pacific and in the South Indian Ocean. We show for the first time that this observed geographic um, pattern cannot be explained only by natural variability, says uh, Hiroyuki uh, Murakami, a climate researcher at um, NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory and lead author. Murakami used climate models to determine the greenhouse gases, man-made aerosols, including particle, uh, particulate pollution and volcanic erosion were influ- influencing where tropical cyclones were hitting. Um, three forces are influencing where storms are hitting. So basically what they're about to go over here is that how climate change affects hurricanes is that it has been changing where they're hitting and the intensity at which they're hitting um, with. So it's not that they're creating more, it's it's that they're changing um, where they're hitting in the world. So they're saying that greenhouse gases are warming the upper atmosphere of the the ocean. This combines to create a more stable atmosphere with less chance um, that co- conviction of air currents will help spawn and build up tropical cyclones. Particulate po- pollution and other aerosols help create clouds and reflect sunlight away from the earth, causing cooling, uh, causing cooling, Murakami said. The decline in po- um, particulate pollution due to pollution control measures may increase the warming of the ocean by allowing more sunlight to be absorbed by the ocean. The mission man-made aerosols is one of the reasons for the act, the uh, the active tropical cyclones in the North Atlantic um, over the last forty years, Murakami said. However, toward the end of this century, tropical cyclones in the North Atlantic are projected to decrease due to the calming effect of greenhouse gases. Volcanic eruptions have also altered the location of where tropical cyclones have occurred, according to the research. For example. The major eruptions in El uh, Chicon, it's, it's in Mexico, it's a town or a city or whatever, in 1982 um, and um, Pinatubo in the Phil- uh, Philippines in 1991 it caused the atmosphere of the northern hemisphere to cool, which shifted tr- um, tropical cyclone activity t- southward for a few years. Ocean warming has resumed since 2000, leading to increased tropical cyclone um, activity in the northern hemisphere. So, uh, climate models project decreases in tropical cyclones toward the end of the 21st century from the average of the annual average of 86 to about 69 worldwide, according to the new study. Dec- declines are projected to in most regions except the Central Pacific, including Hawaii, where tropical cyclones activity is expected to increase. Despite a, a projected de- uh, decline in tropical cyclones by 2100, many of these cyclones will be significantly more severe. Why? With rising sea surface temperatures, fuel the intensity and destructiveness of tropical storms. So, basically, hurricanes are being affected by all these, um, the greenhouse effect about the warming uh, of the oceans and all that sort of stuff. So, one of the things that I pretty much um, gathered from all this research is basically, all this stuff, the weather, the earth, all of this connected. And when you start changing one element of, of, of that formula, I guess you could say, it affects everything um, um, that's involved. And the, when the weather and the climate of the world is basically um, changing and a lot of these things, storms are becoming more severe. severe. Um, the, the fires are becoming more severe. The, the hurricanes are becoming more severe. Some of these super um, thunderstorms or tornadoes are becoming more severe. The raining, the flooding is becoming more severe. And the reason why all this is important is because when you read Matthew 24, one thing that kind of jumps out at you is that he's talking a lot about world um, uh, weather events or natural disasters like famines, pestilence, pestilence 
earthquakes. Um, and it can't be um, a coincidence that he's talking about those things as being signs of the times, right? And so that's why, like, that's what led this whole this whole uh, research about. So what is where did this climate? What is climate change? Where did it come from? How is it connected to the, the, the to the signs of the times? And Daniel twenty four it talks about an increase in knowledge, and that increase in knowledge started happening during the Middle Ages, which is where a lot of these um, signs, like the pestilence, the famines, all the stuff. It's not just talking about our time. It's talking about all the the uh, the uh, Middle Ages up to now. Um, it's when all these things will start to really start to occur on a wild, worldwide basis more frequently. And an uh, uh, increase in knowledge has led to a lot of these things starting to happen with the intensity and the widespread that they are. For example, with the famines, uh, with, with the pestilence with the, um, that we went over in the pandemics in the last sermon, it takes human spreading um, that disease from one human to another for it to become the, to, to grow and get bigger. Well, quite naturally, if there's more people in the world, there's the, the 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 scale of how big the pandemics can get on the increase. So, like a pandemic, if you don't know, is when you have like a, a disease that spreads from one country to another. So, once it crosses a border, it's called a pandemic, right? So, if you have more people in the world and more people all over the world, that's why when this pandemic happened this time, it spread across the entire world and it spread really really quickly. Whereas before, like in the first pandemics. It may only have affected one or two countries in a small geographical area. So basically, um, as the world population has grown and the need for factories and the need for all these things have increased and we're, we're putting all this stuff out into the atmosphere, the climate of the world is changing, which is causing the severe weather um, that we're experiencing. And it's, you know, and then here in Matthew 24, um, verse eight, it says, all these are the beginnings of sorrows. I believe that these are all reminders that we are at the end of time. And when these things are happening, we should, they should be reminders that, that the Lord is almost, he's almost here, right? Like if he didn't come back, these things are only going to continue to get worse. Um, as time goes on, we have damaged our world in a lot of different ways. We have um, technology, which we're going to talk about the wars and rumors of wars, that we have the technology to destroy ourselves basically, which is what these um, uh, world wars are all about. And, and that was in, that was 60, 70 years ago, right? It's only We've only gotten more technology to destroy ourselves. So all these are signs that, that the Lord is almost back. And so when we see these things happening, we should, that the first thing we should think of, oh, this is another sign. He's coming back. Instead of, you know, wondering, what is this all about? Why is this happening? It's happening because Jesus said it was going to happen, because he could foresee all this happening um, when he was talking to the disciples. So which my closing thoughts is, as we study Matthew 24 and we go over these other things he's talking about here, they're all connected. And we shouldn't be um, sad or scared when these things are happening. We should be encouraged because the Lord is almost back, which is what we all want. It's time to put all the sorrow and all these things to bed um, so that we can go home with our Lord. And so um, in the next sermon, I believe I'm going to go over famines and earthquakes, maybe the false prophets, or I may split that up in different ways um, because there are a lot of examples of those things as well. Um, but this is why I went over climate change was because it is very related with what has happened and what was prophesied at the end of time. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I, what I came up with. I learned a lot when I was trying to um, research this topic and that's why I wanted to share with everybody today. All right. So, um, how about we go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for foretelling all the events that would be happening here at the end of time. Thank you for getting us prepared, um, for sharing um, the secrets uh, of the future when you were talking to your disciples, when you were uh, giving this information to Daniel. Thank you so much for not leaving us in the dark, for always providing the light for us to be able to study and to learn and be prepared 
um, for these end times, Lord. We know these things have to come to pass. We know they are signs of your second coming. And we know um, through Revelation um, about the plagues that are coming and about the events that are going to be happening, Lord, because you have prepared us for that. And Lord, we just want to praise you and thank you so much for um, for giving your people um, the, the, the forehand knowledge of what is going to happen so that we can be prepared for that time. Lord, we want to thank you and praise you, your holy name, and give you all the glory that you deserve. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.